Hello, welcome to our AMF Members Discussion Forum. I'm Pam Solomon. And I'm Andy McNeil. And we're thrilled to be your host for these forums. The AMF Discussion Forum is brought to you by Heal Grief, a social support network creating community after someone has died. Everything we do is inspired by our core belief that no one should ever grieve alone. Our goal with this forum is to bring our community members an opportunity to engage with some amazing people, to discuss various ways to normalize and educate the community at large about issues of grief. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Niemeyer. Dr. Niemeyer is professor of psychology at the University of Memphis, where he maintains an active clinical practice. He also directs the Portland Institute for Loss and Transition, which provides training internationally in grief therapy. Since completing his doctoral training at the University of Nebraska in 1982, he has published 30 books. He serves as editor of the journal Death Studies, the author of nearly 500 articles and book chapters, he is currently working to advance a more adequate theory of grieving as a meaning-making process, both in his published work and through his frequent professional workshops for national and international audiences. Dr. Niemeyer serves as president, served as president of the Association for Death Education and Counseling, ADEC, and chair of the International Work Group on Death, Dying, and Bereavement. In recognition of his scholarly contributions, he has been granted the Eminent Faculty Award by the University of Memphis, made a fellow of the Clinical Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association, and given Lifetime Achievement Awards by both the Association of Death Education and Counseling and their International Network on Personal Meaning. We are certainly delighted to have Dr. Niemeyer with us. Uh, Dr. Niemeyer, we are we just just delighted to have you as, a, as our guest on this forum. Very gratified to join you, and I appreciate your inviting me to be a part of your community. So, Doctor, before we get into your amazing work, might you share with our audience your personal moment when grief shaped your career path? Well, the reality is that, uh, of course, it is more than one such point. Uh, the Probably a, a crucial turning point for me occurred in my, there were several such in my childhood. Um, some of them I, I would not even have known the word grief to apply to them. I, there was a terrible time when my, uh, my pet dog got into the hutch in which we kept our pet rabbits and their carcasses were slaughtered and strewn all around our backyard. That was a horrific traumatic grief for a uh, a six or seven year old boy to uh, discover uh, the, the terrible ambivalence that came with that. Yeah. Um, other early experiences of loss included the death of my grandmother in my home, uh, Katie Clancy, my, uh, my father's mom, who lived with us. And in many ways, I think my father's own uh, sadness and depression deepened in response to that and also to other complications, financial reversals, his growing blindness, and probably other dynamics that I could not possibly have understood as a, a, a young pre-teenage boy, um, eventuating in his ending his life by suicide when I was just 10 days shy of my 12th birthday. And so with that event, most particularly, Fran, I think I along with my family, moved into, uh, all of us know very well, of death-related loss. Um, we know it intimately sometimes in our work lives or our bereavement support roles, but we know it as well in our own uh, lives and roles. And, and many are moved to do this work, uh, to reach out to others on the basis of their own experiences of profound loss. And that loss, of course, takes the form not only of the Bob, your 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 sound has muted for some reason. That happened. Oh yeah. Okay. So, right. what what's the last thing you heard from me, Andy? You this. you you had talked about how we all have this personal you know, okay personal loss. And, and the personal losses, of course, importantly include not only the death of loved ones, uh, but also 
those losses of important person, persons, places, projects, possessions, uh, as we experience relational ruptures, as we lose important careers, as we simply shift in our careers and a whole network of relations and colleague uh, connections uh, be, fade for us as we move geographically and sometimes across countries. In the current climate of COVID and the coronavirus, of course, we experience many additional losses of security, of predictability, of agency, of control, of the, the summer or the future we thought we would have, uh, a bleaching out of our connections with others, uh, loss of childcare, loss of employment, loss of income, loss of financial security. All of these can occasion grief. So the the losses in my own life, large and small, are merely uh, my own small cup of suffering um, drawn up from a sea of, of common uh, human losses uh, and in which we are currently drowning as a, as a species. Bob, um, I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I remember years ago when I first read, I think, an article you had written on meaning making. Um, and it was, I think I was at the Amelia Center at the time uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. And, um, and I remember reading it and just nodding my head the whole way through, you know, just in, in full agreement and thinking about families that I had spent time with and sat with and mm -hmm. that process of, yeah. you know, making meaning. And I, I'm just curious that even about that, just in your own life and, mm -hmm. and how meaning making has been an important piece to that. But then you know, you really have, have uh, with a lot of things that you brought to our field, but I think meaning making that, that model really, um, it's at least had an impact on me. So I wonder if you could talk some about, about sure, that. About sure, that. Andy. I mean, one of the tricky things about speaking in terms of meaning when we're also talking about mourning is that we intuitively deeply in our bodies and hearts recognize that grief is a profoundly emotional experience. And this is why early models like Kubler-Ross has basically featured a series of stages of emotions, right? Of denial and depression and anger. And um, these are familiar dimensions of grieving. Um, and they are, they are certainly close to the heart of what we experience. But they underrepresent the profound disorganization, the anxious place that we are thrust into when the world we knew and the relationships that sustained that world dissolve, right? Whether that dissolution happens one neuron at a time as we lose a loved one to dementia, one breath at a time to COPD, one cell at a time to cancer, these long and unsettling goodbyes um, are in some sense just um, they're, they're eroding the basic existential ground on which we stand, the relational ground in which we find security. Um, and, I th and still more so when the deaths happen suddenly and tragically in an off-time way, and it is our child who dies of overdose, or our partner, or our parent, or our sibling, or our friend who dies by suicide, or in a traffic accident, or an act of violence, or a natural disaster. In all of these circumstances, our world of meaning can be not only uh, sort of eroded, but also exploded, just shattered by the experience of loss. And we are forced then to recognize that we are struggling to reaffirm or reconstruct a world of meaning. How do we put together a world that works? What is the ongoing meaning of my relationship with the one who has died? I think of this in terms of backstory work. We're trying to bring forward the backstory of our relationship with our loved one and address the deep questions. How now do I love them? How now do I reestablish a sense of secure bonding, sustainable even beyond death? Where can I find support for that in caring relationships, support groups, um, in the cultural, uh, in my spiritual frame? And we also struggle for meaning at the level of the event story of the death itself. <clears throat> what happened here and why? 
how do we even understand the insidious, invisible hand of COVID-19 and the way in which it, it takes our loved ones from us when we can't even visit them in hospital, when we're underinformed by the uh, beleaguered physicians and nurses and other care, uh, caring professionals who have no time to deal with family. They're just trying to pro provide care in this critical point. Um, and we are disempowered and are left with great guilt and a sense of abandonment by the system, just as we also have, feel we have abandoned our loved one. Whether or not they die of COVID-19, if they die in this era, they likely die in alienation from these loving connections. All of these challenge our most fundamental sense of who we are and of whose we are. And we have to somehow reweave the fabric of life in a way that makes sense of those experiences, that makes sense of what we have been through, that makes sense of who we are and who we will become now, individually and together. So when I talk about meaning, it's not this kind of robotic, cognitive, intellectual pursuit, right? It is deeply heartfelt. It is deeply embodied. It is intimately relational. We are broken in our hearts and souls and bonds. We are looking for a way to heal those ruptures. We're looking for a way for life to be meaningful again and for us to understand ourselves and others in a changed world. That's what I mean by meaning. Yeah. Very eloquently put, and uh, it, 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 thank goodness for your work. Um, we're so grateful for it because there's still a social stigma where people expect one to get over um, a death loss and to move forward and, and to forget. And how often do we hear that where what you're doing is really reframing that and saying, yeah. well, how can, we, how can we grow with and yeah. how can we make more of, um, which, is, which is really quite beautiful. And I'd just like to take a moment at this time, if anybody in our audience um, does have questions, again, this is interactive, so please feel free to um, start submitting them in the chat and we'll be able to get, get to them. Um, so we, Vanessa, yeah, I was gonna say, say, I see Vanessa um, has something. Do you wanna unmute yourself, please, and, and interact with our, with our guest? Yes, please, thank you. I am trying to grieve the recent traumatic deaths of many Black people. And I understand that my grieving is in some ways different and in some ways similar to people who are Black. And I was just wondering if you could speak more to the way that I could grieve most meaningfully as a white person and most meaningfully how we could all come together in grief. Well, of course, as you ask this question, and you might want to mute now so we don't get the feedback. Um, as you ask this question, Vanessa, it's a particularly challenging one because I too am of a, a white background. I'm a blend of Irish and uh, German Americans, uh, immigrants. Uh, and so I can't particularly claim to know the black experience uh, with intimacy. Of course, I have worked alongside uh, black people who have experienced mm -hmm. profound loss, uh, it, not only in our research, where we tried to understand the impact of homicide on family members and communities um, in terms of historical research we've done on slave narratives and the multiple ways in which a history of slavery um, used the experience of loss in order to uh, strip away the humanity of people, depriving them of choice over even who they would have as their, as their partners, um, as they were reduced to uh, you know, being mere, mere chattel or possessions of the slave owners. So I also lived for 36 years in Memphis, Tennessee, which is an African-American city. And, um, and so as a minority member of that community, uh, I, I witnessed a lot. I had deep conversations with people um, and sometimes in therapy, uh, attended far too many funerals uh, for black uh, uh, colleagues, friends, clients, um, many of whom died tragically. Uh, 
and at five to 10 times the rate of homicide than white Americans experience. So, but all of this is a vicarious experience. I am not African American. I cannot know that with the intimacy with which they are uh, certainly introduced into this, whether they wish it or not. Um, from that position of, uh, of humility, I think what I would want to say is that um, there are ways in which our grief is like all other grief. At the end of the day, to use the words of a guy named Harry Stack Sullivan from the 1950s, we are all simply more human than otherwise. Right? We all love, we all lose, we often lose tragically. And maybe the, the, the closest we can come to developing empathy for the different losses of others is to deeply inquire into our own. When are the times that we felt disempowered, disenfranchised? Um, when was our grief not seen? Um, what cultural grief do we carry that we fail to acknowledge? Uh, there was a time when Irish in this country were treated uh, scarcely better than African Americans uh, have been treated. Um, and reminding ourselves of the capacity for, uh, for hate um, in every historical era and frame for the, the way in which uh, privilege subordinates those who lack it. Um, all of these are calls to consciousness. And uh, if we receive them with humility and earnestness and an open heart, then I, I think we can at least be better allies with those who are struggling to reclaim their humanity and that of their people um, without arrogating unto ourselves the idea that we can somehow lead the movement. Um, but we can be better followers. We can be better allies. Um, so in some ways, a little bit as we are challenged to do in our therapy and counseling roles, we are being invited into an experience that is not our own. We have to draw close enough to it that we can feel it, that the tears that come are responsive tears to the tragedy of other lives, um, that they are tears that galvanize action, uh, change behavior, deep reflection on our own culpability as well. Um, but that we also stand back from it enough to recognize that the suffering that we are relating to belongs to the other person and it is not ours. So it's not a kind of, uh, we're not co-opting their pain, um, but we are, we're standing under it with them. And we are understanding it with them in this sense. Um, we can be better listeners than we have been, and we can be better co-actors than we have been uh, in continuing to challenge and change these social systems. So, you know, these are the spontaneous uh, remarks from someone who, like you, uh, stands on the side, but in solidarity, I hope. Yeah. Very beautifully it. said. Yeah. I think so. We do have another question, but before we did, I did want to make the point. It, it is interesting to me to just to watch with the pandemic and then, of course, now with the Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement, um, how, how there's this corporate sense of grief. And so thank you for that question, Vanessa, because it is. It's where, does, where do I put that for personally? Uh, and thank you for that. You know, it was a great illustration about just in our, I think in our, um, uh, as helpers, taking that position of, as a learner and a listener and um, you know, moving forward with that. We do have another question I wanted to put out. Um, uh, uh, Cordelia, uh, you have a question if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask that yeah. question. Um, yeah, I would like to hear um, your thoughts on how like continuing bonds or like an ongoing bond could be, would be like for clients who think that death is final and that there is nothing left, like there's no life after. So the thought of having that bond seems um, impossible. And also combined with that difficult relationship before the death and grieving that now there's no hope 
for a better relationship? Well, Cordelia, these are both beautiful questions. I appreciate your, your asking them. Um, first of all, I should say that um, the, the emergence of a, a, a kind of um, a recognition of the importance of continuing bonds that really, in a way, was announced in the field of grief and bereavement by the 1996 publication of the book by Class Silverman and Nickman uh, called Continuing Bonds with its absolutely beautiful follow-up by Class and Stefan um, just, uh, you know, just last year, I guess. Um, uh, that was a kind of turning point in the world of grief, bereavement, thanatology, the study of death and dying. But what it is turning to is turning back to what we have always known in virtually every cultural frame, with the exception of the 20th century, for very good historical reasons, when in 1916, um, 1917, um, uh, Sigmund Freud wrote and published his, his book, or his important essay, Mourning and Melancholia, that's where we really developed the idea that the goal of grieving was to let go rather than to find an alternative way of holding on. And it's important to remember that that was published in the, the height of World War I, when you had 6,000 people dying per day in Europe of every European nationality, 6,000. It was as, as if the American experience of 9-11 were happening every morning and every evening of every day, of every week, of every month for 48 months in a row. And under that condition, the Victorian, the kind of classical model of mourning that emphasized sentimental bonds and connections, simply couldn't hold. And people collectively in Western culture moved into a kind of traumatized grief in which they had to exclude all of the, uh, the hard work of grieving just in order to continue with the work of living and, and fighting the war. So what we understood then to be the basis of 20th century grief theory really was not about grief at all. It was about trauma. And it, it enshrined a pathological um, response to trauma as a normative response to grieving. So what we have done, I think, is we have begun to recover and explore and study and work clinically with the compelling human need to restore a bond to preserve a bond beyond death. We are often helped, but not always, by spiritual traditions that enable us to do so. Um, the spirits of our ancestors, if we have a, if we're Japanese, we may have a Buddhakon and they are um, our family home, a kind of altar. This is also common in uh, Chinese cultures and uh, ways in which we honor those seven generations back, for example. Uh, cultures like uh, the, uh, in Oaxaca and in Mexico and in, uh, now more generally throughout uh, Latin America, El Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, uh, where we intimately relate to the, the dying in Jewish culture. You have the art site unveilings, ongoing interactions with the dead. In culture after culture after culture through historical uh, time have enshrined these as important relations. Even in a materialistic, non-spiritual, uh, rational kind of frame, in the Western world, we preserve these bonds. Uh, we may do it in writing grief memoirs. We may uh, write letters to the dead on their memorial Facebook page. We find ways of speaking the names of our dead children, at least to those who will hear those names. Um, and in all of these humble ways, we are working to, in some way, uh, reconstruct the bond rather than to relinquish it. Now, sometimes, as you imply, and this is your second beautiful question, um, that's difficult to do because the relationship was charged with conflict, even though it was also close. These are two dimensions we've specifically measured and studied in our research on what complicates grieving. Or we may face unfinished business. 
Again, I'm getting a little echo. Let's make sure we're muted. Um, the, um, we face unfinished business, unresolved relationship issues. Uh, may, maybe we have a need for forgiveness or to forgive the other. Maybe we feel like the circumstances of the dying or the circumstances of our relationship at the time someone died um, denied us the opportunity to come back together, to share stories, to affirm love, to reconnect, to build legacy. In all of these ways, then, uh, we may be left with a, a burden of unfinished business in relation to the loved one. And this is a proper goal of grief therapy to address this. Um, in the Portland Institute, we have all kinds of training. Now it's online training, but we also do it on site. We do uh, live virtual training and we have a, a whole uh, library now of, uh, that continues to build of uh, online training resources. And much of this has to do with addressing these kinds of issues of the, the trauma-informed work of dealing with the rupture of the event story in our lives, the rupture of the story of the loved ones dying, and the backstory work, the attachment-informed work about how we can work with these bonds to restore a sense of conversation and connection with the deceased, to address the problems that reside in that relationship. I would even say that as grief counselors and therapists, um, a hallmark of our profession is that we are family therapists to the dead. We are the ones who work with relationships between the living and the dying. We're not the only ones. In, in spiritual or spiritualist frames, there are other ways of doing that. Shamanistic frames in traditional cultures. All of these have to do with allowing a kind of reconnection with the dead. But whether or not we believe in that as a literal place or dimension where they reside and can reconnect with us, or whether we see it as fostering a kind of dialogue between the parts of us um, that need the relation and the parts of them that we have taken in and live within us, right? Then in, in even the, uh, a kind of uh, secular grief therapy, um, these are things that are compellingly important. And I find that the work I do in therapy alongside clients, um, it takes different forms depending on people's belief systems, spiritual or secular, but it's the same kind of work. We're trying to restore bonds, to integrate relationships, to integrate parts of the bereaved person self anchored in those relationships. Um, and then to reach out into a family and community that speaks their name, that shares their story, that does not compound their physical death with social death, that banishes them from the realm of the living. Um, so I, I just believe that anything that honors the deceased helps us in our grief. Anything that dishonors the, the deceased um, impedes our grieving well. I mean, and in a lot of ways, Dr. Niemeyer, isn't, isn't that even just the, the um, uh, preserving the bonds, isn't that even a piece and part of meaning making, whether we, oh, yeah. whether we think of it that way or not, right? That it's, yeah. it's and sort of... At the end of the day, I don't care right. if you think of it in terms of meaning making or not, but I, I see it in terms of what gives life meaning? Well larger purposes, ideals, values that we seek to embody, live out, embrace, be instructed by, grow in relation to. Um, as my colleague uh, Nina Verma in, 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 uh, in India uh, writes about and speaks about beautifully, uh, the, this conjunction of grief and growth is inherently meaningful uh, and it's something to be fostered. Um, but also, we, and maybe even more fundamentally, as mammals, we are bonded with others of our kind. Mm -hmm. right? we, we have a, you know, in John Bowlby's terms, a powerful attachment bond to those who provide uh, security and connection for us, especially at points of vulnerability, you know, often parenting figures, grandparenting figures, caregiving figures. And we equally have a caregiving bond that we extend to those to whom we provide care, most notably our children, 
but also those who we tend and befriend um, intimately in, in relation to all manner of, of things. And uh, these commonly include our, our partners, our spouses, um, our siblings, our, our dearest friends, uh, sometimes our clients. And so I see all of that as about meaning. What relationships have meaning? What relationships give meaning to your life? What is the meaning of those living and dead relationships now as the, the relationship, in a sense, continues to live even when the person doesn't? Um, to me, it's all about meaning, uh, including the, the difficult meanings that are raised, right? When we, our, our meaning system, our sense of our assumptive world, that the world is predictable, understandable, uh, in some measure controllable, I can protect others, I, I love from harm, and, and then something, an act of violence, uh, as in the, the George Floyd uh, tragedy, um, or the, the pervasive kind of uh, threat uh, that has now taken 120,000 uh, American lives um, in terms of COVID-19. Um, you know, those kinds of experiences reveal uh, the illusory quality of the world assumptions that, that grant us this control and predictability. And so we are forced in some way to rework a world of meaning that makes sense in light of experiences that don't. Um, so. It's interesting to me how, how often a discussion about death is actually really a discussion about life uh, mm -hmm. in, in that regard when you think of it that way. We do have a couple more questions. I wanted to uh, call some folks uh, on to come on with us. Um, Mary, uh, is that uh, Cecilio? Cecilio? Cecilio. Cecilio. <laughs> I tried. I tried. I, I got fancy with the L's. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, please ask your question. Uh, yes, Dr. Niemeyer, um, how do you feel we can best help our patients, our clients who have lost family members uh, or friends from COVID-19, which you alluded to, you know, in the beginning of your talk, um, when the, the mourner was not able to say goodbye uh, or even to be present to comfort their loved ones when they were dying. Yeah. In fact, uh, I did a, a whole kind of program on that, Mary, that you might find ah. interesting, uh, hmm. that it's, it's available as one of the online training modules in the, uh, on the Portland Institute uh, .org webpage. Um, but in summary, um, I, I do think that there is much that can be done now, not only in relation to COVID deaths, but deaths that are unfolding during the COVID era that are subject to all of the same alienating policies and practices, which are medically mandated, but psychologically very complicating uh, that you allude to, the disengagement. We can't sit in that uncomfortable vinyl chair alongside the bed of our loved one. We can't hold their hand. We can't kiss their cheek. We can't wipe away their tears. We can't share the stories. We can't um, do all of those things that, uh, that both honor them and resolve the, the tough pieces of our living together. Uh, all of that is denied us. And so people are left and will be left for years to come. This is not a temporary thing. For years to come, mm -hmm. people will be grappling with these deeply unsettling, disempowering circumstances in which all losses occur in 2020 and possibly beyond, um, whatever people are dying of. So uh, what can we do in the aftermath of those well, I think there are a number of things. Uh, for one thing, um, we need to remember that uh, the, the pain that we are experiencing about that is a living thing that's occurring in the present moment. It's not located in the past. And so we need to address it in the present moment way that it, you know, that it arises. People's sense of guilt about not having been there for their loved one is a present moment emotion. And anything that we can do in therapy that is experienced as real is real in its consequences. So we have to release our rationalistic love of logic 
and engage the healing power of imagination, the healing power of the heart, the healing power of metaphor and ritual, and help people practice healing rituals in therapy and beyond it. So for example, um, to foster a, a correspondence with the deceased, perhaps in the person's journal, where they maybe we help them find some conversation starters, right? Uh, to write to their loved one, uh, whether it's on the computer or in longhand or a dictated note on their phone. Um, the one thing I always wanted you to know about me is, the one thing you never understood was, right? Um, the, the one question I had for you is, just to begin with prompts that correspond to the person's deepest need that they are ready to meet. And when we find that growing edge where deep need, sometimes inarticulate need, meets with readiness, we can find an appropriate tool to use or a step to take to help the person take one step in the direction of addressing that. For me, I find that being able to write letters to the deceased, not unsent letters that are intended to say goodbye, but as Michael White once said, letters that essentially say hello again. The goal is not to seek closure in a relationship, it's to seek reopening of the relationship. And so I ask people to write from the heart of what needs to be said now, what needed to be said at the time of the dying and couldn't be, and then to bring that in, to read it to me in therapy or the parts they wish to share with me, um, to read it in the bereavement support group, the parts they wish to share with others, and then to basically in the intervening week between then and the next session, to consider writing a letter back as if from their loved one to themselves, to really maybe go into a meditative, quiet, contemplative place open the mind and heart to what they would hear the other saying in response to this same letter that they might reread silently or aloud as they close their eyes, maybe with a few cleansing breaths, just try to listen for that whisper or that consoling voice or that authoritative or maybe even humorous voice of the other that, that responds and and then to write that letter back as if to ourselves and make that then a part of the subsequent therapeutic processing. Here's what I sensed my mother would tell me about that, right? She'd say, stop being a martyr, Bob. You couldn't control this. This was bigger than us. And please know that I always love you and I, I will be with you in the ways I can be. And these kinds of communications do much more, I think, to heal the, the ruptures than any kind of advice or you know, kind of uh, instruction we can give people. We let them instruct themselves. We let the deceased instruct them in a sense. Um, when I deal with, I remember very well, dealing with a bereaved mother and father whose uh, daughter at the age of 19 died by suicide. And there's a lot of unfinished business as you can imagine. And, the mother was preoccupied for months with why, 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 Christine, why, why did you kill yourself? Why didn't you call me that night? Always before when you had these struggles, you called me, I'd talk you through them. Why? I couldn't answer those whys. Who could? Christine could. Who did she need to talk to? Her daughter. How could she do that? I'd help her find a way. And we brought an empty chair into the therapy. We cast her husband as a loving supporter on the side, silently witnessing and, and rejoining the conversation after this sacred interaction. I helped her find those words. Uh, tell her more. Tell her more about what you don't understand, Tricia. Right? What more do you need her to know about how this affected you? What more do you need to know from her? And she poured it out along with the tears. And then as the sobs grew quiet. I said, could you come over here and, and take your daughter's seat? And what would you want to say back to this mother so racked with guilt and questions? And sitting in the chair like an adolescent, kind of leaning back, slouching, she said, mom, 
this is so not about you. And in an adolescent voice, she lovingly explained to her mom um, the changed circumstances in her life that left her orienting not to mom, but to, as she said, a darker star that drew her in problematic relationship. And, uh, and mom began a series of conversations then that day in, the, in our practice and the session that continued in the kitchen of her home, continued in the shower, and uh, she'd have additional questions. She'd ask her daughter. She could sense the response. She would drive with her to work playing music that would invoke her daughter's presence. And she'd talk with her all the way to her work in the hospital as a nurse and uh, get out, close the door on the grief, close the door on her daughter, but reopen it at the end of the workday. So people find ways of reconnecting. If we join them creatively and non-rationally, then we can, we can introduce profound change very quickly. Oh, that's amazing. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a, quite a few questions in the queue. We have Gail Rubin up next. Gail, would you like to unmute yourself? Mary, if you'd be kind enough to mute yourself. Thank you. It's an honor to uh, be participating in this conversation this morning. So my question uh, involves new technology and how that can help us better connect <laughs> with our deceased loved ones. I'm actually working with a startup company that wants, that will be putting uh, video cameras at the graves of loved ones and also offering the opportunity for somebody to prepare before they die to uh, write messages or create videos that could be sent to the loved ones after death. What do you think about that? Do you think that would be a helpful development for yeah, it actually already is practiced in some countries, um, and it's. Uh, I think that's the that is an interesting feature. Um, uh, it's even gone beyond that, um, where with high level technology using a uh, hundred cameras, um, the there are, are companies, and one can see this uh, in terms of like Holocaust uh, testimony that is available on on YouTube, you can uh, find some very interesting examples of this, where you can materialize a three-dimensional responsive image of a deceased person having who has recorded um, in later life, perhaps, um, a, a thousand responses to uh, various questions that might be put to him or her. And in response to the spoken question of the person interacting with this three-dimensional life-size image of the loved one, uh, they can respond spontaneously and cogently to nearly every question uh, in a way that is astonishingly lifelike. And you have a sense of literally a, a, like the incarnation of the person speaking. Uh, so that kind of work is, uh, is actually uh, is happening uh, now. Um, the, so I do think that technology can be an interesting um, sort of extension. Uh, oftentimes, and you know, this has been true for hundreds of years, we have found meaning in reading the documents left by the deceased for us. Uh, we may consult their partly written biography. Uh, now, of course, with practices like dignity, dignity therapy, Harvey Chachanoff's work of doing uh, intensive, respectful interviews with people at points of clarity and pain control in the course of their end-of-life care, we record the stories of their lives, uh, what they recall of significance, the life lessons that they have learned, the accumulated wisdom that they wish to leave as a legacy to their family, the humorous stories uh, of their early days, their people who maybe were their heroes when they were young kids and why. And in all of these, we have a precious kind of legacy document, whether that is something that is written down and typed up as in a dignity therapy intervention and conferred as a legacy gift to the family after being read at the bedside, including the, the dying person and the uh, living family members, or whether it is a video recording of such conversations um, that 
were recorded specifically, as you imply, by the, uh, the person who in later life is, is wanting to leave something of a, a living trace of conversation, maybe even for like children or grandchildren who are not yet old enough to really grasp it, but it will be available for them when they're ready. And now, you know, every mobile phone can be a, a good way of documenting those conversations. So th that's merely one way in which technology can be a guide. Um, I do think that it's important that we not defer to technology so strongly that we miss the capacity for human relationships because all of that is still a far cry from a human hug. We need the creaturely contact of touch, of bonds, of proximity. Uh, I was talking to my neighbor and her husband was uh, put into uh, a hospital at a massive coronary uh, near the beginning of the, the COVID uh, crisis in, here in Portland, Oregon. And she took him to the hospital and that's the last time she saw him. Uh, he's still in uh, intensive care there um, after a quadruple bypass surgery. And so the only contact she can have is by phone when a nurse can you know, hold the phone to his face for a little while and, uh, and they can talk in FaceTime. And she said to me, you know, Bob, the words come through, the images come through, but the feelings don't, the feelings don't. And I, you know, I just feel this wave of sadness wash through me as I repeat her words to you. Um, we need to respect what technology can give. We need to also uh, understand what it may not give and how the, the best sort of um, advice for dying well and grieving well is to live well before it happens. If our relationships are full, open-hearted, true, honest, authentic, if we address problems and attempt to resolve them, if we meet others in humility and compassion, if we can release our self-importance enough to see the legitimacy of their alternative perspective, then we'll have a lot less unfinished business to deal with technologically or psychotherapeutically when uh, one or the other of us dies. So I think this goes back to Andy's point that, you know, dying well implies living well and, uh, and vice versa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Doc. I just wanted to, I wanted to mention just real quickly, there's a, a Netflix, it's a Netflix show called Afterlife where it's the spouse uh, each episode is the spouse who died giving information to the surviving uh, uh, husband um, and, he, and it shows her video and talking to him. It's very, very reminiscent of what you're talking about. It's, it's a reality show. It's not a uh, contrived. No, it's contrived. It's, I think it's uh, Ricky no. Gervais wrote and directed it and acts in it. And it's mm -hmm. just about, it's, it's all about grief. The entire mm -hmm. show is about it. Mm -hmm. I, it just made me think of it when you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about the video. We do have other questions here, so. I'll um, try to be briefer in answering them, addressing them. Yeah, well, we, we have a you know, few minutes left. So we'll, um, we're gonna go to, I don't have a name, but I have LL66228. And if you could state your name when you come on. Yes, Are you there? I, I, I'm here, can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. This is my work computer. So you're, you're seeing my, my personnel number there. It's Julie is my name. And uh, thank you so much for bringing this opportunity to us. And, and Dr. Niemeyer, I'm wondering if you think there will be the political will to make palliative care and end of life care more accessible as a result of the impact of COVID-19 especially on the residents of our long-term care facilities and the living conditions that have been exposed? No. Oh. Next question. <laughs> I, I, well, I think it, that I don't mean to deal with that in a cavalier way. Of course, I have the same wish that you do. Um, I also have, um, and I, I don't want to politicize the discussion, but I think when we say, do we have the political will, much depends on our leadership. And 
the priorities of that leadership and whether that leadership is motivated by compassion or consumption, right? Whether it is, uh, you know, seeking a, a kind of uh, empathic response to a context of high need um, or whether it's primarily motivated by economic or power assertive, uh, you know, sort of motives. Um, so, you no, know, we have some choice about that uh, in, to a degree, right? We choose who we elect to such offices and, and we can sense what their priorities and perspectives are. Um, but the, I think there is the, the hard reality that motivated my brief and negative response is that um, the, we are in a global recession. And for many years to come, we will not have the resources that allow for profound innovation of systems. Uh, when we think of human resilience, it usually occurs in a context of wounded individuals or families or communities in the context of intact systems, broader family, community, or national systems. In this circumstance, universally, all cultures, all societies are reduced. Um, unemployment is massive throughout the planet and it's getting a lot worse in a lot of places. You know, Brazil, India, they're just skyrocketing in the uh, impacts and the deaths. Um, and so we're gonna have a lot less to work with. Um, so I think it is in a realistic sense, um, I think we are entering a time of damage control rather than um, profound and humane innovation. Now, I would like to believe that centering down and becoming wise, we can reorganize priorities in a way that do a better job in some areas. But I think that uh, the kinds of programming that extend the, the genuine uh, benefits of palliative care or hospice to vulnerable communities uh, and people uh, and systems, like as you say, in elder care facilities. Boy, I just don't know. I, I, I want to believe it's possible. I want to work for that. Um, but I think we got some very profound challenges when it, uh, it'll be hard to even, uh, you know, reactivate systems, uh, schools, colleges failing, um, uh, the the massive budgetary deficits that will exist at every level from the federal to the municipal. Um, where will the money and, uh, you know, and personnel power to make these differences to extend services instead of simply trying to conserve the, them as best we can? It's going to be a hard go. So we have to be in that for the long haul. Uh, you know, basically, uh, I think in order to, to hope for that and, and work for that, that outcome. Thank you for your answer. Um, we have a question from Brooke Bro, I believe is how you say it. That's correct. Um, so you sort of answered my, some of my question in your response to, uh, I believe it was Julie's question. Uh, so I'm gonna change it slightly. And I'd like to ask, how do you think um, individuals can change to better support the bereaved? Uh, I think if we, uh, first of all, become reflective practitioners uh, or support figures, and this implies that we sort of do the work in our own lives of acknowledging the role of loss in shaping who we are and what we become uh, for the better and worse. Um, you know, many of the ways in which we defend against realities uh, that we don't like by uh, studiously avoiding them or practicing uh, a, a lifestyle that seems to imply that we are not soft bodies in a hard world, that we're somehow invulnerable. Um, these are typical ways that we get through life and not only in adolescence, but uh, we tend to uh, uh, downplay our own uh, vulnerability. I think that being a good supporter to others means that we have to meet them on a level playing field, um, that we ourselves are, um, we have been wounded and hurt and, uh, and we will continue to be. 
Uh, maybe we are now. So we need to attend to our own grief generously and with compassion and with a, an urge, again, to quote my friend Nina, uh, to convert grief into growth. Um, and then we're better able to do that with others. That's one piece. Um, that's more abstract and intentional. Um, but what at a concrete level can we do? We can grow comfortable with stillness. We can learn to listen more deeply and speak more prudently and softly. We can relinquish the idea that we're the sage on the stage that can teach people how to grieve well with some little psychoeducational lesson. And we can position ourselves instead as guides on the side, right? Fellow travelers uh, in a terrain of loss, a world made strange by, by loss and bereavement. Um, so taking a stance of humility, we can allow the, the bereaved to teach us what they need, what they're ready for. We can take those tentative steps with them. We can celebrate those achievements. Um, we can stand with them in the darkness and in that earn a chance to walk with them into the light. So I think it, support and therapy begin with who we are and then the extent of what we do, not the reverse. It's a human interaction, much more than a technical one, although we can learn techniques that are very helpful. But to be chosen well, we have to show up. Uh, it all begins with presence, and only much later does it advance to procedure. How, you know, in, I, I think about just even in my own life, how by involving myself in certain types of this type of work, has changed me, right? So it's, you know, there may be the conscious, how do I need to change and be present? But then mm -hmm. it's just by being who we are in this space, uh, gotcha. yeah. it changes us, right? It, yeah. it, it partly shapes us in some ways. Yeah, that's that's yeah. profoundly true, Andy. I, I fully agree with you. I think that I, I, I hope and I believe and I, you know, I would contend that the uh, therapy I've done with a uh, thousand people has made a difference in their lives, but it, I have to say it's made a much bigger difference in mine because uh, I've had a lot more therapy and, and on the, on the, my uh, receiving end than, uh, you know, than any of them, right? Because I, it's those moments of encounter repeated again and again and again, just as you say, change who we are. We were invited into more tolerance, more depth, more wisdom, uh, more practical know-how. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, we do have, we're going to take a couple more questions. Uh, we'll, we're, we're right at about 2.05. We're going to go for another maybe 10 minutes and then we'll wrap things up. Um, but let's go to diets. Before you do that, can I, I'd like to tag on to something that Bob mentioned. Yes, please. I, would, and I think that's incredibly important. Uh, Bob, uh, in the terms of working with people who want to become grief counselors, sorely neglected in many places, I know not in yours and not in mine either, is the whole issue of the effect of the bereaved on you. What is it bringing up for you? And uh, what are you blocking out for yourself? And mm. The time and the attention, the care, the letting them know it's okay to feel sad uh, or to feel angry, to feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, so much work needs to be done and I have felt and now myself as well. Uh, we formed a support group for therapists in my place mm -hmm. or want to look at what is that dimension of what goes on with self with the individual particularly from those who present with grief mm -hmm. and loss issues whether it's death grief or non-death grief whatever it is and it's amazing to see mm -hmm. the interests of certain individuals I, I really want to look at that and they do and they come in and so i'm one of the members of the support group i'm not the leader but mm -hmm. i'm there and so that's that's where we are and i think Bringing that for coming from you is so delicious for me because I can say, hey, and Bob says this. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, the, the, the deep teaching is the teaching that arises in our hearts and our relations. It's not uh, from any given voice. All of us together know much more than any one of us individually. And um, I'm very affirmed, Shep, uh, when you describe that because it comes from a position of you know, a being a man I know to be wise and compassionate with many years of service. And uh, 
a deep commitment to humanity. So I'm touched and instructed by those words. Um, I'll carry them with me. Uh, and just, I thank you for that. that thank, you. thank you. And that's also touching for me. Thank you. So we'll invite, we'll invite uh, Diets 15. You want to unmute? Okay. Oh, we can't hear you. You're unmuted, but for some reason we still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, my question is, you know, as, as you're talking, what I'm thinking of is how our society has become so spread out. It's not uncommon for immediate families to be in four different corners of the country. It's not uncommon for your primary support group to be spread throughout di different countries even. Um, and I think a lot of that is with the idea that you could get to people if you needed to, wanted to, and COVID has challenged a lot of that. And so from your perspective, I guess I'm wondering, one, what challenges that might pose in the meaning making work that we do with clients. And then on the flip side, how we can use meaning making work to kind of bridge some of those gaps that might be you know, when we think about that kind of continuing thread of the story that, that might be disrupted or the rupture, as you, as you said. Well, I mean, you, you raise something that is uh, very intimately a part of my life daily, and it has been for many months. Um, my partner is in India, uh, where she was uh, studying advanced yoga practice in an ashram in the jungles uh, outside of Goa when the COVID crisis rolled in. And international travel ceased um, and quarantine ensued, uh, lockdown uh, in all different levels. Um, so there for month after month after month after month and with months yet to come, she will be there and not here. And these have been difficult months for us, very difficult, a lot of pain, a lot of separation, a lot of fear, a lot of threat to the relationship. And just as you imply, uh, an inability to find that creaturely comfort that would naturally arise when we have mobility and the chance of literally being with another. Um, so I'm very sensitive to that. Um, what have I found personally that's helped? Um, I've done a lot of personal processing. I've done it with, uh, with close friends. I'm in an art making circle with another member of the Portland Institute faculty, Sharon Strauss, and several other PI faculty, um, where weekly we use collage, uh, spontaneous painting. Uh, sometimes I've shared poetry that in a way allow for the externalization of these complex internal feelings to be seen, held, heard, in a, a circle of love uh, that uh, leaves us feeling um, like someone gets us and uh, they're with us in it, even though we're doing so, you know, from the other side of the country. Likewise, with my partner, uh, Agnieszka is her name, um, you know, we, of course, schedule uh, daily calls. Those are often deeply meaningful. Uh, they're often emotional. Uh, we write one another um, sometimes with poetic intensity uh, in daily text. We send photos. Uh, and, and so in these commonplace ways that I think everyone would uh, intuitively understand, we seek to serve, you know, conserve connection. Um, um, how can we augment that? Well, we can take a, a kind of play from Shep's uh, playbook. We can have a, a kind of support group. Uh, for people, right? And we can do it in a virtual medium in which with appropriate ground rules, you know, people can feel connected with others contending with similar issues or for working with a family, really fostering meaningful conversations, sometimes mediated by a therapist who helps them do more than just share the events of the day, but to speak uh, of what really matters. Um, I think we can provide guidelines for people that um, maybe, I, you know, I'm just thinking of this now, but kind of conversation starters. Uh, you know, what's one thing, uh, you, you know, your dad would really like to hear from you. Uh, and, you know, mom, what, what would you want to pass on to your, your daughter in this 
difficult time when she's really struggling with even getting childcare at her distant city of Houston. Um, you know, I think that we can we can use technology to assist with these things. Um, we can look for ways to be together at the same time and same place. So, what, or different places, but the same time. I think about the power of uh, a funeral, for example, which is greatly vitiated or reduced in this climate, right? Where maybe we have some kind of online observation, maybe we have none at all. But if we do have something online, can we all agree that we will, you know, watch that video at the same time, that we will, you know, do the ceremonious thing of maybe lighting a candle uh, in the, the room uh, where we do this, that we will augment whatever the standard um, funeral services or memorial service uh, that is broadcast with our personal participation. We sit with our families in our living rooms. We share a story about grandmother or uh, father and uh, that, and these can be, you know, obviously shared with others who are part of that circle in a Zoom style meeting. Um, we can, you know, use the idea of memorial web pages and so on to continue the conversation. So I do think that we can, even across distance, uh, reaffirm bonds. And, and we can commit to living those bonds more intimately when it is possible to do so once more, um, to look to prioritize maybe family-related travel over just going to another uh, you know, Caribbean beach. Um, maybe that's more meaningful if we do it with uh, a set of loved ones. So I think it implies values of a longer term sort, even beyond the crisis. Bob, Bob, are you able to take one more question? You're, sure. We'll do one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, uh, Brittany, Brittany, is it Croy? Brittany Croy? Yes, Croy, thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit more about if there is a person who doesn't believe in anything after death? Like, how do they form a meaning if they believe that life just ends? Oh, I think easily that if if life is what we have, then we want to make it as intensely meaningful as possible. And if I'm I'm living this present moment with you in a way that recognizes your secular sacred being, right? The uniqueness of this moment that will never be repeated. This is a, maybe the only time that Bob and Brittany will meet. And if I can hold you in and value that contribution of your, your emotion and your, your statement to me, your question to, uh, to me, uh, I regard you as a kind of almost a, a Buddha showing up to ask me a deep question and invite a deep answer. Um, whether or not uh, I encounter you or you encounter an afterlife, is almost of secondary consideration. Uh, this moment becomes the eternity that we share. It has its own fullness. And if there is that later opportunity and afterlife opportunity for a continued bond, uh, then it's built on something valuable and lovely. Um, so I think that how we live uh, also configures how we die and it it may even help configure how we are beyond our death uh, if, we, if we have such belief. Um, so I think rather than in some way uh, discounting the meaning of living, uh, we might even see the absence of uh, an afterlife as contributing to the importance of, of living meaningfully. Uh, in the very least, it is not diminished by the absence of a, that theological perspective. Thank you. And what if the, what I really am interested in is if the person, so there, um, a person who suffers a loss and they're grieving and they're trying to make meaning, but they believe that like that person is dead and gone and like nothing's happened. Like how can they make a meaningful bond if they believe that their loved one died and that's it? Does well, that make sense? Then, yeah, then the question becomes, what kind of uh, 
of existence can that person have now? Well, they can have a lot of, you know, potential importance. I mean, we are all shaped by the, those who have gone before us. Uh, people contribute to the very language we, we use, uh, the homes in which we live, uh, the, you know, the social structures that sustain us. All of these were built by other hands and often those hands have, uh, have stopped moving and those voices have fallen silent. But the, the impact of those lives shapes our own in the most intimate ways. And so how would we want our loved one to continue to uh, have a place in the world? Um, how can we keep their stories alive? And who would join us on that project? Uh, when we face difficulties, adversities, uncertainties in our lives, and we imagine, what would they tell us about these things? How can we be instructed by their counsel? How can we offer that wisdom, perhaps, of a, uh, whether it is a grandparent or a child who has died, how can we offer that to others going forward? Um, how does, you know, as Andy said earlier, how does the participation of that person in our life um, change who we are and what we bring to relationships? How does the imprint of the other, you know, still have a discernible shape in the memory foam of our heart and soul? Um, we may become their living extension. And so we, we owe it to them and to ourselves and to the world to remember them well, to embody them well, to carry forward the best of who they were um, as we continue our living. And, um, and that it may be especially true if they are not in some alternative dimension of existence. If this is how they live, if their heart, if our heart is the place they live, we want to take good care of that heart and we want to give uh, space to their voice and presence in our ongoing lives. So I don't think this is antagonistic to any religious or spiritual view, but I think it augments it and adds dimension to it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and thank everyone else as well. We, we actually are short on time. Bob, I wanted to give you a chance to just have a, if you had closing remarks or, or a last word. And, and if even in that, I, and I know most folks probably know how they can connect with you, but um, if you wanted to, to let folks know how they can connect with you beyond certainly this uh, conversation. It seems appropriate that you would invite a continuing bond here, doesn't it, right? It's, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty accessible. I, I, I did retire from the University of Memphis in, uh, in December, so don't go looking for me there. Look for me in Portland, Oregon. Uh, if any of you want to come and visit, you're welcome to. I've got four guest bedrooms here in this big house, and uh, I'd love to have them filled with friends. Um, the... Uh, the way to reach me is probably through the Portland Institute for Loss and Transition, PI. That's a kind of grief therapy training institute without walls. It's, uh, we provide global training, and, and now we have a lot of you know, video programs uh, where we, we train in specific uh, models and methods of grief therapy and support. So uh, if you go to portlandinstitute.org, then you will find all of that. And uh, that's one way to reach me. And, and, and I hope for a continued connection with you all. Uh, it's been wonderful to be invited into your community to begin a conversation, and I hope we can continue. Um, I'm, I'm so gratified that Heal Reef has, has brought together uh, this kind of community and this kind of communion, um, which really does have a, uh, a sacred secular quality to me. And uh, I appreciate your inviting me into into the tabernacle. So thank you for that. Doctor, thank you so much. And we want to thank you for being our guest here for this discussion forum and for sharing your work with our audience. Thank you so much. The pleasure is my friend. Yeah. And we want to thank all of you who joined us as well. Uh, thank you so much for your questions and for your interaction. Uh, it just makes the conversation, it makes the experience even more rich for all of us. Um, if you would like to learn more about Heal Grief, please visit us at healgrief.org. At healgrief.org, you can learn more about all of our programs and resources. 
including our national network of support for grieving young adults called Actively Moving Forward. And make sure you go to Heal Grief to join us for our AMF app so you too can be part of a community of others with similar goals and interests. So again, thank you for joining us and we will see you next time on the AMF Members Discussion Forum. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And that was lovely.